Good morning and welcome to day two of the Green Horizon Summit organized by the Green Finance Institute, the City of London Corporation, together with the World Economic Forum. Yesterday surely was a landmark in the rise and rise of green finance. The UK government committed to a sovereign green bond in 2021 and set out a pathway for mandatory climate risk disclosure, becoming the first G20 country to take this step. They also announced the taxonomy, standards of definition for green finance, which shall be in harmony with EU standards. The Bank of England announced a new date for climate stress tests for banks. And Christine Lagarde, Christine, Kristalina Georgieva, and the UN Secretary General encouraged us all to do more faster. A sense of urgency prevailed throughout, and dare I say it, a determination to see practical solutions and action. We also saw a flurry of action from the private sector. Mark Carney set out the COP26 private finance strategy, which sees concrete actions for financial firms to take ahead of Glasgow next year. And David Blood of Generation Investment Management launched a major report on measuring investor portfolio alignment with Paris. With asset owners and managers increasingly navigating a sea of new standards and metrics, the clarity of this new approach is needed and offers promise. Today, we will focus on developing markets, on the carbon markets, and on the economics of biodiversity loss, and on climate change, adaptation, and resilience. Now, numbers aren't everything, so I'm very happy that the comments that you have been making on the side have also been very positive as to the quality of what you've heard. Thank you. But as numbers are also quite interesting, yesterday we had 130,000 live stream views to our website and social channels and I'm sure there are more statistics to come. So thank you very much for being with us. So may I now introduce the policy chair of the City of London Corporation, Catherine McGuinness, to kick off day two. Good morning, and welcome to the fifth session of the Green Horizon Summit. I'm Catherine McGuinness, and I'm the Policy Chair at the City of London Corporation. And I'd like to start by thanking all our speakers today, and also all of you for joining from across the globe. I think the level of attendance today shows the level of concern at this major issue. And what we'll be looking at this morning is an important and timely question. How the finance sector and government can work together in unlocking green growth across the globe. Before I introduce the session, I'd just like to take this opportunity to make three key points. Firstly, that cities must lead the way in both the transition to the net zero economy and in preparing for the effects of climate change that are already locked in. And secondly, addressing climate change is not only the right thing to do, it's a commercial necessity it's crucial for sustainable recovery and, more importantly, for growth. And lastly, commitment alone, however ambitious, will not be enough. There, there needs to be a deep and collective urgency to act. Among the many challenges of 2020, it's been heartening to see the sustained commitment to keeping climate action on the agenda. A health crisis hasn't distracted us from tackling the climate crisis. In fact, it's focused our attention on how connected we all are and how important it is that our response should have both people and planet at the core. For many, cities may not traditionally have been seen as beacons of environmental responsibility, evoking images of crowded streets, concrete sprawl and polluted air. Cities have both the power and the duty to protect people and the environments that they live, work and visit. Cities are the commercial heartbeat of nations and the livelihoods of many rely on their resilience. As we work through today's questions, let's remember what really matters. The health and well-being of our people and ensuring that our actions are felt in the real economy. Within the City of London, we recently unveiled our own ambitious action plan to make the square mile the world's greenest global financial centre. 
We've committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2040 across all categories of emissions. That's 10 years before government goals. To meet this target, we're taking bold, radical action to reimagine the green city of the future. Through our Climate Action Plan, we will implement a range of measures driving jobs and growth, building climate resilience and tackling climate change head on. We will, for example, update our planning regulations to ensure that new buildings are sustainable and include carbon reduction designs. We will dedicate more street space to cycling and walking and will enhance carbon removal by introducing sustainable land management practices ensure our investments are Paris aligned and develop a climate action fund working alongside city businesses to invest in low and zero carbon technologies. This strategy sets out our ambition for London to lead the way on climate action. For London and financial centres around the world, this is no longer a nice to have. It's no longer even just the right thing to do. It's a complete necessity. We must be commercially resilient for the future. We've seen the importance of this through the pandemic. The economies that have fared best have been those that were best prepared. Those that had invested in the technology, the systems, the infrastructure, which meant that uh, when faced with a crisis, they were able to adapt and thrive. The coming months will undoubtedly be a challenge for all of us, not least as we continue to grapple with COVID-19. But now is also the moment to plan for the future. And that is why we published our report, London Recharged, last month, looking at London of 2025. The report looks at the questions we need to be asking ourselves now. What action can we now take to support a sustainable recovery, to protect our long-term competitiveness, and to ensure that we are fit for the future? We have a once-in-a-generation opportunity to build a greener, more sustainable economy. And we must seize this opportunity. The signatures on our ambitious commitments are dry. I think we can all agree we need to move faster on the enabling actions. I urge us all not to let today be just another conversation. We all know that decisions made in the next few years will determine the global emissions trajectory for decades to come. We hold the fate of the Paris Agreement in our hands. We hear a lot about the investment gap to deliver Paris and how we need to shift from billions to trillions. We hear much less frequently how we can make this happen. And that's the express purpose of this week's summit, bringing stakeholders together from across the globe to identify the real tangible actions we can and must all take. Climate change is a global challenge requiring global collaboration. From business, government, to each of us as individuals, we all have a role to play in the fight against climate change. We will start with keen insights from His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, before hearing from Shimara Wickramanayaki from Macquarie, Minister Luhut from Indonesia, and Mike Bloomberg. We will then hear th three essential perspectives to closing the Paris finance gap. First, we will hear from the private finance perspective, from investors actively looking for new opportunities in emerging markets and the actions they are taking to invest today. Second, we'll hear from their counterparts in the public finance arena with their take on what more can be done to crowd in investment. And finally, we will hear the view from the ground with Dr. Bajun sharing his views on what China's net zero commitment means for finance and for the Belt and Road. I look forward to today's discussions and to continuing to work with our partners across London, the UK and around the world as we work to achieve a greener, more sustainable future. Thank you and it's now my very great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, someone who has spoken out on these issues for years, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to have been invited by 
the Lord Mayor of London, to speak to you today at this Green Horizons Summit about my Sustainable Markets Initiative. The current pandemic has brought unimaginable devastation to people's lives, livelihoods and national economies. At the same time, the green recovery represents an unprecedented opportunity to rethink and reset the ways in which we live and do business. Now, I have long believed that we need a shift in our economic model that places nature and the world's transition to net zero at the heart of how we operate, prioritising the pursuit of sustainable, inclusive growth in the decades to come. Having uh, been championing climate action now for the last, I don't know, I suppose 40 years, I can tell you that this isn't a fight for the faint-hearted. However, increasingly we are seeing more and more businesses, investors and consumers prioritising sustainability and thus creating a much more virtuous circle of supply and demand. By leveraging market forces and the immense resources of the private sector, there is hope that we can transform the situation. But I'm afraid we are literally at the last hour and there is real urgency for action. We know now what we have to do to rescue the situation, rather than going on talking about it. In September, to mark Climate Week, I called for a new Marshall-like plan for people, planet and nature. I look forward to detailing and mobilising action for this plan in the weeks and months ahead. Today, uh, as we focus on financing and investment to drive the green recovery, I, I would like, if I may, to highlight 10 actions that could make a tremendous difference. First of all, we must proactively mobilise investment in sustainable infrastructure, with a focus on carving out a global asset class for sustainable project financing to unlock capital currently invested elsewhere. Second, we must work to establish functioning global markets for natural capital and carbon offsets, enabling rewards for negative emissions by developing new market frameworks. Third, uh, we must pr promote the scale-up of emerging technologies that support sustainability and provide them with the advisory support they need to access capital markets more quickly. Fourth, uh, we must rigorously work towards the provision of reliable data and actively advance the adoption of common metrics and standards, as, for example, uh, in the IBC scorecard, in order to allow more informed assessments of sustainability compliance and opportunities for improvement, in particular with regard to alignment with the Paris Agreement. It is time now to move to unified metrics and global standards to encourage accelerated progress through uniform benchmarking. Fifth, we must provide development finance capital to promote research and development and innovative sustainable solutions, while leveraging financial innovations to accommodate small to medium enterprises, which typically find it difficult to access significant pools of capital. Sixth, we must build nature-based solutions and carbon capture, use and storage into companies' asset base and supply chains. We need to advise clients how this can offer significant economic growth opportunities in areas such as the circular bioeconomy, ecotourism and green public infrastructure. The only way, ladies and gentlemen, to reduce emissions at the scale required, short of a ban on fossil fuels, is to accelerate the development, implementation and scaling up of carbon capture use and storage, both nature-based and engineered, to buy us a precious time while allowing us uh, rapidly to draw down carbon emissions as we transition towards a net zero global economy. Seventh, we must start accounting for natural capital on companies' balance sheets. 
Without this, firms simply cannot tell the true value of their asset base, nor how damaging their operations may be on the natural world. So we must put nature and sustainability at the centre of companies' business models, their analysis, decisions and actions, and ask them to report on it. Eighth, we must be bold enough to reimagine industries through the lens of sustainable markets to create more resilient and sustainable products, services and supply chains, while in parallel helping the transition efforts. Ninth, we must make the sustainable options the trusted and attainable options for consumers. With consumers controlling an estimated 60% of global GDP, people around the world have the power to drive the transformation to sustainable markets. We must better communicate with consumers about the sustainability of the goods, services and investments we offer. Tenth, and finally, we must end perverse subsidies and improve incentives for sustainable alternatives. It must be a real priority to level the playing field and to think about how we properly deploy incentives, policies and regulation in a way that catalyzes sustainable markets and comprehensively considers long-term economic sustainability. Ladies and gentlemen, achieving a sustainable future is the growth story of our time and can, in fact, fuel our post-pandemic recovery in a way that benefits people's lives and livelihoods and nature's own economy and pays dividends for decades to come. But, but the window for action is rapidly closing. With the urgency required, I hope Ladies and gentlemen, you will join me to drive a new Marshall-like plan for nature, people and planet, led by the private sector, to align our collective efforts and resources for the highest possible impact. Our children and grandchildren deserve nothing less. Good morning everyone. I'd like to start by thanking the City of London for convening this important discussion in the month when we had expected to meet in Glasgow for COP26. I'm delighted to join you virtually today and have been asked to talk about mobilising capital and how we can work together to accelerate the green transition in emerging markets. It's almost exactly five years since the Paris Agreement and we're approaching the end of the first year of what we know will be a decisive decade in delivering on the Paris commitments. And while we all have our own decarbonisation and transition challenges, we know they will be greatest for the countries that lie between where I am here in Sydney and where many of you are in the City of London. Those of us in this virtual room hold many of the solutions to affect the vast scale of change that's needed. And the City of London has long been synonymous with financial institutions and the role that we play in our communities. And that role has never been more significant than in relation to green finance. We're proud to count ourselves as one of the many leaders in progressive green finance with our own global climate finance activities led from the UK. And I'd like to spend the next few minutes giving you my perspective on this. But first, let me very briefly introduce Macquarie. As a global investor and financier, we're working to accelerate the global green transition in three main ways. First, meeting the need for more renewable energy. Our green investment group has 25 gigawatts of new projects in development, a fifth of which is in emerging markets. Second, in strengthening the climate resilience and lowering the carbon impact of the infrastructure we all rely on, led mainly through our Miro business, the world's largest real asset manager. And finally, helping our clients to decarbonise. This is a priority across our activities 
including our commodities and global markets business, recognised recently as the Environmental Markets Bank of the Year. We're active in decarbonisation solutions across energy, agriculture, transportation, waste, industrial emissions and real estate. And last month we held our own virtual conference on the energy transition, bringing together over 1,500 clients and stakeholders. And like this event, it was an affirming reminder of the determination across the public and private sectors to work together to deliver the outcomes our planet needs. Alongside the need for more development projects and clear policy frameworks, one of the biggest challenges facing the public and private sector is increasing the flow of private capital into low carbon investments in emerging economies. This was one of the key challenges identified by the Climate Finance Leadership Initiative. Analysis in its report last year showed that two thirds of emerging markets failed to record more than $100 million of investment in clean energy assets each year. This is the equivalent of the finance needed for just one large scale solar or wind project. And to close this investment gap, we in financial services have an obligation to be clear on our requirements and to work constructively with emerging market governments to create the required conditions. This was the intent behind the CFLI's investment readiness guidelines. The world has capital to invest and that capital is increasingly seeking returns from projects that actively address our most fundamental challenges. And Macquarie is one of the many companies introducing capital to opportunities and we are also a well capitalised business ourselves. Shareholders have entrusted us to put capital to work in developing projects and in meeting community needs. We also have our largest ever pool of dry powder equity under management in our funds. It's mobile capital and we're only stewards of it working on behalf of fund investors and shareholders, many of whom are ultimately pensioners and insurance holders who rightly have expectations about what we do with it in terms of their need for appropriate risk adjusted return while also delivering sound social outcomes. So while we have a need and desire to deploy ever larger sums in energy transition and in emerging markets, the capital can only flow to the countries, companies and projects that are investment ready and allow us to manage risks to an acceptable level for investors. So let me give you three different examples where we're seeing that happen. And my first is a story about the creative use of limited public capital to mobilise private capital, and deliver transformational change and build local capability. Here, the UK government has long been a global leader in climate finance at home and internationally. And one example of this is a joint venture they've established with our green investment group to channel public climate finance into emerging markets through a dedicated 200 million pound pilot program called UK Climate Investments. Together we have delivered a range of innovative investments. In Kenya, we've provided cornerstone funding for an affordable green housing platform, introducing a green kicker mechanism to incentivize both climate and financial outperformance. And in India, we've created a first of its kind private yield co for international investors to help finance the world's largest reverse auction renewable energy program. And in South Africa, we saw a gap in the market for black economic empowerment businesses to participate in South Africa's growing renewable sector. And now local commercial banks are looking to replicate the innovative long-term financing instrument that we developed. The common theme here is using relatively scarce public capital to catalyse and credentialise investment in sustainable energy and infrastructure in sectors, jurisdictions or structures that aren't widely investable. This is a model that's replicable, scalable and draws on the best of the public and private sector's capabilities. Now my second story is a demonstration of the power of establishing a thriving new market ecosystem for private investment in renewables. And in 2015, Taiwan's electricity mix was 80% coal and gas. 
In 2017, the Taiwanese government signalled a commitment to increase the volume of electricity supply from renewables from 5% to 25% in eight years. A target was set to deliver 5.7 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2025 and another 10 gigawatts by 2035. The clear target and associated changes to the regulatory regime gave us the confidence to start developing a three-phase project co to construct 2.5 gigawatts. Phase one, Taiwan's first commercial scale project, is now operational with phase two in construction. Similarly, positive investment conditions are being created in other countries like Vietnam, the Philippines, Indonesia, and across Latin America. The success of these countries is built on their governments clearly articulating a direction and targets and a well-defined and consistent commercial, regulatory and legal framework. This incentivizes private investors to devote time, money and effort to build a pipeline of projects fostering capital market development and local supply. Now, not all progress is dependent on government action. A third strand of positive momentum is building behind power purchase agreements between renewable energy developers and large multinational corporates working in emerging markets such as Brazil. These agreements de-risk the development of projects by providing long-term visibility on offtake. These various approaches demonstrate how emerging markets can unlock the flows of capital they'll need to build infrastructure to achieve and stretch their NDC commitments. But as important as that is, near-term climate impacts mean these countries must place an equal weighting on investment in climate adaptation. They must attract capital to meet the challenges of retrofitting existing infrastructure and building new infrastructure for a world of rising sea levels and increasingly severe weather. I was lucky enough to visit Bangladesh last year as part of our work with the Global Commission on Adaptation. And Bangladesh is a striking example of the power of effective adaptation in the face of devastating storms. Starting with early warning systems, enhanced disaster response includes cyclone shelters, civic awareness, strengthened buildings, and improved post-disaster recovery to drastically reduce the lives lost from each storm. Now, I started by noting the five-year anniversary of the Paris Agreement and the decisive decade that lies ahead of us. But let me end by looking one year into the future, where I sincerely hope we'll be gathering in Glasgow for COP26. It will be a moment of high stakes when governments of the world will reaffirm and extend their climate ambitions. We in the financial sector will need to match those ambitions and we as Macquarie Group look forward to working with you all to make sure that Glasgow in 2021 meets and exceeds the success of Paris in 2015. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here on this occasion. I thank the Lord uh, Mayor of London, Honorable Alderman William Russell, and the World Economic Forum and UK's Green Finance Institute for inviting me to speak before such important gathering of policymakers and financiers. Uh, we met now on the years of challenge. Most countries in the world are still dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, and Indonesia is no exception. But we are all have to be optimistic that together we can soon sail past this storm. In Indonesia, we are pleased to see that the trend of growth of uh, COVID cases is declining, giving us a boost of confidence that we are on the right track in dealing with it. The majority of cases are in eight of our 34 provinces. They are Jakarta, West Java, Central Java, East Java, Bali, North Sumatra, Sulawesi Selatan, and Kalimantan Selatan. About month and a half ago, the president, the president assigned me to start handling the COVID pandemic in these eight provinces. 
Our approach are relatively simple, namely first changing behavior and increasing community discipline to follow health protocols. Second, increasing the availability of self-isolation facilities throughout Indonesia. Third, ensuring standardization of clinical management and drug availability in various COVID-19 referral hospitals in Indonesia. These eight provinces were responsible for the contributing 72% of national cases when I had just started. And currently, the eight provinces contributed less than 60% of national cases. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm optimistic that starting next year, Indonesian economy will continue to grow positively. Amid the current and uncertain global condition, Indonesia is taking the momentum to carry out regulatory reform. Recently, the government and Indonesian parliament passed the job creation law. This law is very historic and a significant breakthrough in making Indonesia a desirable investment destination. In essence, this is an omnibus law. Through this law, the government simplified and synchronized 8,451 national regulation and 15,965 regional regulation that had overburdened small, medium businesses and large companies. And an important chapter in this omnibus law also regulate the establishment of our sovereign wealth fund. We have to make sure that regulations are aligned with the international best practices in sovereign wealth fund. Another one is the reform of the labor law. This new chapter will balance the protection of labor law with the creation of jobs on par with the labor law of other top investment destination countries. Ladies and gentlemen, Indonesia always do what is right for the environment. Therefore, Indonesia will not let the pandemic derail our effort to reduce marine plastic debris as much as 70% by 2025, as well as 30% of solid waste in general through reduce, reuse, recycle, and circular economic principles. I very much welcome a platform of partnerships like this in bringing businesses, international donors, and national and local governments, community groups, and world-class experts together to collaborate on tackling plastic pollution and waste of problem. I want to express my gratitude uh, commitments shown by the UK government and global businesses leader to be here today in support of this noble cause, as we all hope that the impact will be as significantly scalable. Solving the plastic pollution problem cannot be done by the government alone. We also need support from all facets of our community. As part of the behavioral change approach, more than 10,000 communities have taken part in many kinds of community scale cleanup action all over archipelago. Furthermore, methods been applied in terms of educating the people reducing single-use plastics and plastic bags and as far as inserting practical teachings in curricula of early age education. We have also done things that are in the last many years have been considered as the mission impossible. For instance, starting 2018, we have cleaned up the Sitarum River that is not long ago still considered as the dirtiest river in the world, polluted with host household trash and industrial waste. We have the military involved in the program to reach a target that within seven years it will be as clean as natural possible. We are proud 80% of achievement the target. We have done similar program at Challenging River, Mount in North, Northern ja Jakarta. And ladies and gentlemen, we find that circular economy approach is the right solution to achieve these targets. Waste will be carried out in an integrated manner from collection to reuse into new resources. We are optimistic that this approach will also create new economic activities and job opportunity for the community. The growth of the waste recycling industry is expected to create more than 120,000 new jobs 
and supporting 3.3 million informal workers. Ladies and gentlemen, the government of Indonesia has enacted a set of regulation to accelerate the growth of waste to energy facilities in Indonesia. We are going to build 12 waste to energy facilities under local government management scheme. Those local governments can individually or jointly have cooperation with private sectors. Other waste to energy projects such as refuse uh, derived uh, fuel RDF and plastic to fuel have also been built in Indonesia. We have just launched the first RDF plant in the city of Chilapchap. It has been operational and has succeed, succeeded in reducing up to 120 million tons uh, waste per day. With the success, we plan to build more than RDF facilities across the cities in Indonesia with a target of 10 RDF facilities in 2021. But most importantly is to deal with the problem at the source of the government of Indonesia requires certain producers, uh, retailers, manufacturers, and food and beverage industry to reduce their plastic-based products, goods of 30% by the end 2028. We are taking steps in giving legal certainties to private sector who keen and in, on investing in waste to energy activities and to take part in the implementation of circular economy. I welcome any collaboration with stakeholders, including international cooperation through the Global Plastic Action Partnership. The world must throw its resources in fighting for environmental sustainability. In time of COVID, we must not perfect our search for a better world. Thank you very much. Aku mau tambahin dikit lah. Muntus sudah. Yeah. Yeah. In time of COVID, we must not forget our search for a better world. And I would like also to emphasize in, the, in my final speech, we are doing a lot in Indonesia. We are not only talking, we are not only uh, have a plan, but we have plan and we execute that plan. Then you can come to Indonesia, see what we are doing in Indonesia. But I don't think this can be happen without support of so many uh, people and so many institutions in order to achieve this one. And we also, has responsibility for the next generation of Indonesia. We are doing this. We don't want to see the victim of the wrong policy of the government of Indonesia could rise the next generation of Indonesia. Thank you. Hello, everyone. First, I want to thank the Lord Mayor the City of London Corporation, and the Green Finance Institute for hosting this timely summit. Let me also thank Mark Carney for all of his strong leadership on climate finance. I've always believed that fighting climate change and strengthening the economy go hand in hand. And while the global pandemic has created a massive economic challenge, it has also created an unprecedented opportunity to spur green growth and to spread the benefits across all communities. Private finance has an important role to play in that work, especially in emerging markets. Last year, Bloomberg joined forces with seven major private sector institutions to launch the Climate Finance Leadership Initiative, or the CFLI for short. And this year, we've been helping emerging markets make climate finance a top recovery strategy so they can accelerate their progress towards a clean energy future. We still have a long way to go to mobilize the trillions of dollars needed to transition to a low carbon economy. To help, we've teamed up with the Association of European Development Finance Institutions and the Global Infrastructure Facility. Together, we're developing a clear set of private sector considerations for policymakers. As of today, our working document is open and we invite your comments. To learn more, visit Bloomberg.com slash CFLI. And thank you for your partnership in creating greener, more resilient economies around the world.
a very warm welcome to Dubai and the rest of the world. We're going to investigate investing in a low carbon future, paths forward to addressing and enabling the environment challenges. My panel today is Tobias Pross, CEO at Allianz Global, Ewan Stevenson, CFO at HSBC, Alberto De Paoli, CFO at Enel, and Maria Hakansson over at Swed Fund. Great to have you with me as a group. Um, let me start with you, Maria, because you perhaps have one of the greatest exposure to uh, emerging markets and running risk. I want to get a sense from all of you. Where are the biggest opportunities in the low carbon climate uh, environment? To you, first of all, Maria. Thank you so much. And I mean, what we can see is, of course, that the pandemic is having consequences on our investments in energy and climate, everything from the slowdown in the economy to effects on delayed payments, projects, disruptions due to supply chain issues and the effects of lockdown. But still, we see in our market, which is mainly sub-Saharan Africa, that we still have a large inflow of projects. The challenge I see is that with an increased risk profile, it's becoming more difficult to actually mobilize capital. And just to highlight some areas where we see important opportunities, I would like to bring up solar. I think Africa has vast resources in this area, but only represent a small fraction of the global energy produced from solar. But with falling technology costs, we are now seeing double digit growth, both in utility scale as well as in off grid development. And I think we will see the same development when it comes to energy storage. I also think it's important to bring up digitalization. I think we have seen many countries doing leapfrogs during the pandemic. And I think you will see there is a huge need for investment in developing countries if you want to capture this possibility, both in infrastructure but also in new things like IoT and the blockchain, creating possibilities for efficiency, but also for sustainable business models based on local needs. So I think we will see a lot more in that arena as well. So you packed a lot in there, Tobias. Let me bring it to you on, on the asset gathering side. The biggest, the biggest opportunities as you see it for the moment in this low carbon, uh, low carbon investing. I think, look, transitioning into a low carbon future is certainly one of our biggest challenges these days. And there have been now concrete steps, <clears throat> especially as, as Oliver Beta, our CEO, announced at the UN Climate Action Summit in 2019, that Allianz is going <clears throat> sorry, to join the Net Zero Asset Owner um, Alliance. And this is also committing to a, a, a neutral investment on our portfolios in 2050. That sounds really long dated. But you have to keep in mind to low carbon, that means we need net zero investments. And this is far beyond water and timber these days. So there's a lot to do. Okay, there's a lot to do. And we'll talk about the enabling of, of, of those investments in just a moment. Let's bring it to the banker. Let's bring it to you and good day to you, sir. What about your proclivity for risk in a low carbon world? Is that shifting? Is that changing? Uh, and especially within emerging markets. Good day. Yeah, I mean, the, the transition, I think, is going to you know, represent an enormous challenge, but equally an enormous opportunity for the banking sector. For us, as you know, we've got a significant bias towards Asia. We see about half of the uh, transition need in financing coming out of Asia over the next 20 to 30 years. Uh, we have a trillion dollar loan portfolio uh, out today. Uh, significant opportunities in sustainable finance, significant opportunities for us in transition finance, and also through our private bank and asset manager finding investment opportunity. So, you know, it is one of the great challenges ahead of us, but equally out of those great challenges comes great opportunity. And Alberto, for you, what, what do you think the biggest opportunities are in the very near term for our audience that are tuning in now? And they're trying to trying to grapple with climate. It's it's on the first tweet from the prime minister to the new uh, president elect. So where are the biggest opportunities that you see? Well, I think it's a it's a whole it's a whole uh, big opportunity. So the energy transition uh, is a fact. Uh, it's a fact because now it's in the economy. It's in the in the economy of results. So, uh, and it's opening a huge level of market that are incredible big in the, in the next 10 years. Uh, we as NL, uh, we have already the, uh, put out 100% of our business model within uh, so the energy transition and sustainability. 
we invest 10 billion euros each year. And so we can classify these 10 billion euros in the four SDG targets that we have committed on. So uh, I think that this is a, a unique opportunity for all the world. I think that also all the, the, the effort to, to restart economy that are now flowing towards the, the new economy and the transition, not to investing in things that are so old things to, to invest in, is the big part of, uh, of this big transition. And Europe uh, is leading this, uh, this, this effort because so in, so taking uh, the, the way to, to invest only in the future. Uh, having said that, uh, it's, uh, it's clear that uh, this is something that is an, a, a global effect. It's clear that different level of risk in different parts of the world may attract or not uh, investments uh, of corporations like us and, and other investors. But uh, working on the framework, uh, on the fact that uh, the new economy is more profitable, as less risky intrinsically, is the way in which we have to build upon, to create and to, to go towards the, the new world. So this panel is specifically uh, about emerging markets. So let's bring it back to you, Ewan, because I know at the core of HSBC, this is about trying to push for, lobby for standards, global standards. I know, Maria, it's something that you focused on, but Ewan, can, can I get a sense from you what do you mean where are we on that journey to create global standards that enable investing in em i think one of the difficulties that we've all got at the moment is you know there's a vast array of esg metrics and standards out across the planet uh, i think we all collectively both the private sector and the public sector uh, need and are working together to try and come up with you know, global standards that are consistent, that are trusted, that are based on science. Uh, and I think until we get there, uh, we will limit the um, appetite of the investment community to invest. Uh, we want to make sure that we can manage, we can measure transition um, in a proper scientific way. So that's what we're all working towards. And Maria, you, you sort of said we were chatting before and you said, actually, you're busier this year than you've been for a long time. You're investing. But that comes down to, in part, what you're talking about standards, but also transparency. How tough has that been this year? And does that shine the light more so on the need for deeper transparency and disclosure in emerging markets? I would say so. I mean, we talked about the challenge for Swed Fund. Our mission is to fight poverty by investing in sustainable businesses. And we have more than 40 years of experience of doing this. And for us, we can see that climate and poverty goes hand in hand. And therefore, we have chosen to do only fossil free since 2014. And we have the target and the goal from our owner to have a neutral portfolio by 2045. But I can really see that because, as I spoke about earlier, we can see the risk profiles increasing. It also becomes a challenge with increased risk also in the contextual environment. So I think that's very important. Then my reflection on standards is that it needs to be integrated in your strategy because you can only measure what you really do. I think that's important. And I fully agree with you that there needs to be some kind of global standard. And I think it needs to be viewed in the same way as we view numbers. And for that to happen, I think it's also needed to be based on research, but also contextualized for different kinds of sectors. So you can see what's good, because when it comes to financial statistics, we can all tell what's a good return rate. But it's much more difficult mm -hmm. when it comes to ESG data. And I think that's really at the heart of it. If you want to make something, you need to contextualize it and base it on the insight so you can act upon it, just like any other data. Well, Alberto, let me, let me bring that to you because uh, what, what we need here is public and private partnership. And part of that is about disclosure and it is about standards. So bringing those two together to invest in this low carbon future. How important are the standards to you and creating global standards as Ewan has just referred to? Or what is it the most important thing to you? Well, yes, I think it's, uh, uh, it's one of the, the, the most important things to have this global standard. I agree on the fact that uh, so when uh, standards are needed, uh, too, ma too many standards are available. So the, at the end, creating some, some confusion. So it's clear that so, we have to, 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 to work to define a, a clear standard that, that are so adopted at all levels. 
So also, uh, I am a co-chair of the CFO Task Force uh, for, uh, on the Global Compact. That is exactly what we are trying to find in the sustainable finance field, to try to, to have a definition of uh, SDG impact thesis and also for sustainable finance. And uh, um, yes, it's clear that on the other side, uh, uh, looking at uh, what we are, uh, so we look also for the developing countries, it's clear that uh, so I do agree on the fact that a specific kind of risk are, are, are rising on these countries. So I want to stress the fact that companies like us are global companies. So we are looking also for a global management of our global risk and global portfolio. So uh, when it is, it, it, so we need also at the global level some kind of instruments of some kind of the way to finance our programs uh, that are not specifically country based, uh, but are so based on standard fully adopted at the, at the global level. So then we can discuss a little bit on our new financial instruments in the in that so are so we invented to try exactly to, to push on this fact that the global print of some companies may flow investments also in developing countries in managing the risk at the global level. Okay, well, we'll come back to the product. We'll come back to the new products in just a moment. I think let's just square off Tobias for you when it, when it comes to this uh, standards uh, and transparency. Look, it's critical for everybody on this panel, but it helps you understand your risk more clearly, doesn't it? So how important is it to you? crucial to us, but um, I think there are already instruments in place. If you think about blinded finance, uh, so we have, mm -hmm. I think from our perspective to mobilize the public sector, really co-create and, and jointly with the private sector coming to the point where we can combine private and public sector um, to one piece. And as Maria alluded to, it's also about risk for private investors. So we have waterfall structures in place which literally can um, put the private investors before the governments so that they will get their return on investment on the one hand side. And I think this priority change on the risk return profile of such as um, they can really help to invest a, into these type of venture capitals, private equity, especially in, in underdeveloped areas or in emerging markets on the one hand side and gives you the certainty that we will get enough capital together to really kickstart these super important projects from a society perspective. So, Maria, listening to what um, Tobias is just saying there about the, reprior the prioritization of capital, I mean, this is, this is the magic sign for global investors into these low carbon projects. It's about where do I stand in the queue when, when I have to assess this risk? Hmm. So well, and I think there's many different aspects. If you want to uh, increase and mobilize capital, I think you need to both to create a pipeline. There is a need for the risking, and then I think you need to have an investor-friendly environment. All three of those are needed. And I think development finance institutions like Swed Fund, I think we play an important role, both in the creation uh, of the pipeline and also in, to some extent, also de-risking. I mean, part of our role is to be catalytical to take risk, to invest early, and also do that on terms that are reasonable and with long tenor so that we over time can mobilize capital. And I also think that the way we work with our business model, I mean, in our case, it's built on the three pillars of impact on society. What are the results that we are creating on the climate? It's based on sustainability, it's financial viability. All three are equally important. And that's also how we work on improving our assets. And that is both, I think, from a risk management perspective, but I think that when you talk about sustainability, it's equally much around value creation. And I think that's an important role that we can play. And then I think the enabling environment will be key. And here I think, as we have talked about earlier, that the public-private partnership is really, really important. Mm -hmm. I think this is a challenge that has been there for many, many years. So I think we also need to think about why hasn't it changed? And I think the answer is it, it's needed with a multi-stakeholder approach. I think it's extremely important that we all bring our different competences to the table, not that we overlap or try to take each other's roles, but that we really try to find a way to find mutually reinforcing actions in this respect. 
So it's about creating the vehicles um, that are available for, for everybody to invest in. So at Allianz, and, and then I'll come back to you, Alberto, as well, in, ter in terms of the innovation on the products. But Tobias, you first of all, it, it's about how to best invest in this space in climate. Is that about product innovation? It is by product and by vehicle innovation because you have different client segments, right? At the moment, it's very much dominated by institutional investors, which is easier to access via mandates or segregated. However, I, I think if you really want to drive innovation in that space, it also needs our retail investors being able to invest into it. And this is to Maria's point, it's very much about collaboration, what we do with the DFIs, uh, comparing, um, for example, our Africa Growth Fund, which we launched last year, where we put 200 million in a venture capital fund investing into Africa, mainly looking after poverty, after education, gender equality. So I think it, you can really orchestrate this in the same way, but it needs the vehicle and the cooperation of the DFIs and private investors. And this means both client segments, institutional and retail clients. And Alberto, let's just bring it back to you. You mentioned the, the product and the vehicle. So just expand on that a little bit um, to, to, to Bias's point. Well, uh, yes. Uh, so first of all, so uh, also us, we are already investing the, in uh, in Africa, in, in India. So we have already a lot of investments there. Here, uh, first of all, and, and so on, we we develop, we invest in Zambia and the scaling solar. So we invest in Tunisia, South Africa, India. So we have already investment there. Here for uh, so reducing the risk, uh, so now we are seeking for partnership, and this is the first thing we do. So we have already uh, defined uh, with North Fund the partnership to develop India, and then now we are seeking another partnership to develop South uh, South uh, uh, South Africa and also the Sub-Saharan area. So this is the first thing. The second is I think it's relevant to bring some knowledge and some things that you have already defined in other countries, also in these countries, to create the framework we were talking about. On the financing side, we are pushing, not there, but now globally, the fact that we think the sustainable finance will have to exit the project level and to enter in a new phase. The new phase is to so have financing back to targets and not to single projects. And for this and to back this program would be to back some financing also for countries like we do for our uh, own programs. We have issued this uh, SDG link bond and now has been renamed the sustainable link bond. This is exactly the way in which we are exiting the green bond uh, uh, portfolio and so to exit the project link financing to enter on the target link finance. We have assumed uh, some SDG target and our financing mm -hmm. It's based on so the achievement of this target, but this is a general purpose bond. So to have a financing, a program and targets and a strategy and not single projects that so provide to rigidity for companies like us and also other companies to pull financing and so developing in our global print and also in the country, in the specific countries in which we are. Ewan, can I bring it back to you? In the end of the day, on, on the banking side, you, you talked about the exposure that you, uh, as an institution, have in China, and you have experience, as it were, in, in that higher risk market, some would say. So to you, what is important when measuring risk uh, for these kind of green and sustainable projects in emerging markets? What's top of your mind as a CFO? Well, when we look at our portfolio today, I guess there's uh two things we worry about i mean firstly um you know we we track six sectors uh closely oil and gas utilities and the like higher risk more carbon intensive sectors which is just over 20 percent of our wholesale portfolio uh we're building climate into the annual credit assessment of those customers um but i think we're only beginning to scratch the surface of this i think there's an enormous amount of work that we and the other banks need to do. Um, I think a lot of this will come out of the Bank of England stress testing work that we're all gonna be subject to in 2021 on climate. Um, but at the moment, we've got some of the data, but not all of the data we need on transition risk. And then on the other side of it, uh, we're very cognizant of the fact that for some of the new sustainable finance, 
uh, not all of it's been successful. So we've had larger credit issues and things like wind and solar. Uh, so again, I think you know, we are cautious. We need support from regulators to make sure that the regulation doesn't penalise excessively the high, high admitters uh, today and equally um, doesn't create capital disincentives for us supporting uh, some of the new sustainable technology, uh, sustainable um, enterprises. Do you think some of the some of the their credit issues, as you say, are some of the sort of blows that you've had maybe in some of the sectors that you put finance to work in, you ha have perhaps held you back and held other banks back from putting more money, deploying more capital and more risk into these emerging markets and into these sustainable projects because of the injuries you've you, you sustained? You know, I don't, I don't think it's stopping us, but banks are not the natural um, holders of equity. Uh, we're the natural mm -hmm. holders of debt. Uh, and we it needs to be, I think, as you're hearing from everyone here, a sort of comprehensive package of support, both from the private sector and the public sector. You know, the bank's sweet spot is providing debt into those uh, enterprises, not equity. Maria, what do you, more do you want to see from the government? You, I think what, I, forgive me, you said 65% of your portfolio is sub-Saharan Africa. So yeah. what more do you want to see from the public side? How does the public side get more robust in meeting the criteria that you set? I think there are many different aspects when it comes to the enabling environment. I think there is always this predictability when it comes to legislation, taxes, consistency and PPA uh, off takers and so on. But I think another important aspect is also the competence and capability for sustainable procurement when it comes to large infrastructure uh, projects financed by governments. We have worked with the grant uh, facility here to actually improve this. And I think that's a good way because what you can enable then is actually increased grid stability, which is a good condition for actually increasing private renewable investments. I think you can mm -hmm. also see the importance of demonstration effects. I think there are things like using renewable energy for baseload, which is normally something where you say you need to use fossil energy, but you can also use renewable energy through dams. And I think if you can utilize the public part in this also, both to drive infrastructure improvement, but also the demonstration to accelerate the development, I think that can be very important. Now, today, I just want to take a moment um, to, to reflect. Um, we're launching as you know, a paper for private sector consideration for policymakers. I just want to get a sense, I just want to go around the panel and get a sense there's an opportunity for people to contribute uh, to this consultative document. So what needs to be in there? Let me bring that to you, Tobias, first of all. What will, what will you be contributing? What will you be lobbying for in that consultation paper? I think to us, scale is, is central in contributing to that um, climate change resilient infrastructure in emerging frontier markets. Thus, however, greater coordination, and, and you have heard this in this panel before, is needed among uh, the DFIs as providers of subordinated capital and private investors to one hand. And, and this then also will address the, the challenge that emerging markets or the investment in emerging markets tend to be a higher commercial risk or to commercial investors. And this is the reason why we need a stronger collaboration between private and public sector, which is addressing um, what we just discussed. And to you, uh, Alberto, what needs to be what needs to be in that paper? Well, I think uh, that uh, so um, this uh, this strong collaboration and uh, uh, is uh, is uh, the, the central part of this uh, of this paper. It's clear that so uh, we have uh, said some some big gaps to be to be managed. One is uh, said so the frameworks uh, that has been to be established in the also in the emerging countries. To have us, a company like us, to be so to rely on uh, uh, some so clear way to invest, and I think in this field it's relevant uh, that all the collaboration would put uh, in place uh, for experienced company like us and other companies can bring to elaborate frameworks that are available for the, our investments. On the other part, I think that this financing gap is the huge part 
of uh, things that we have to work together in this uh, for to, to elaborate in this in this paper this financing gap is uh, related to a lot of things as said so a lack of instruments on one side and on the other side the fact that uh, so institutional uh, development banks uh, uh, will have to collaborate at the global level because at the local level all the best practices that we can put in place at the global level may make flows mm. to the local level to support uh, local investments. I think these two aspects are the most important things that we have to stress. Yeah, and what would you be lobbying for at a practical level to, to I suppose, build this public-private uh, corridor and, and bring us closer together? Yeah, I think what we've all been talking about here is improving trust and confidence in uh, investment. So we've talked about having global standards that we all trust. Uh, I think we need to see regulation and policy that's fully aligned to providing sustainability agendas. Uh, I think we need to improve disclosure standards for everyone who's reporting in a consistent way that we all trust and backed by the auditing profession. Um, and I think we need uh, we need a functioning carbon trading offset market as well, again, which is an important component of all of this. So uh, I think the governments have got a big role to play in creating that framework that we can all invest into. And Maria, let's just close it off with, with, with you. I think it's important both, and I think that's been mentioned, to bring lessons learned from successful countries. What have they done? And then that the different actors list what are the requirements from us. But I think it's important that a document like this can't be a prescriptive set of guidelines to implement or mandatory investment requirements, but rather a starting point for a dialogue. And I think that's the important part, that we actually get the dialogue going with different countries and taking into consideration also that all countries have different starting points in different contexts and I think that's a very important factor to bring there's not one answer for everyone and then I can only echo the importance of uh, global standards for uh, impact and for ESG I think that will be key as well for mobilizing capital so I'm going to pick up probably the biggest single global theme and go slightly off piece but just to get your your response we have uh, a, a new president elect who on the front page of his um, transition document, it's about climate. The first tweet from the British Prime Minister to the new president-elect was about climate. To what extent, Tobias, I take it to you first of all, to what extent does a new administration with a, a different agenda, um, let's put it that way, what does that do to the global narrative and the global view of risk? We're dealing with emerging markets, paths to, to invest in, in emerging markets, but what does that new narrative do for the global investing appetite into emerging markets in climate and carbon. Okay, hopefully will give us more certainty as Joe Biden, as president-elect, first statement was that he will rejoin the Co-op 21 agreement, which is, I think, uh, a good news to us um, as society. And this is not a German or European wish. I think this is a global demand for, I have to say. With regards to emerging markets, I think it will just be a better packaged message from the US. Um, but if you look on, on the trade war with China, we do not expect that there will be a huge difference in terms of if you look at the GDP pre-crisis, post-crisis, China has been very much coming back to, to old strength, while the westernized world is still uh, lagging behind. And this means there's a, a bigger catch up needed. And this is a US and continental and European phenomenon. So I expect that Joe Biden, and you also have seen what he has um, sent as a message on, on defense costs on the NATO. Um, I, I think also as a vice president to Barack Obama, his position has not changed there. So more okay, to come. More, more to come. You and a quick response from you in terms of what do, does it help the narrative that we're discussing here on this panel today. Yeah, it's absolutely got to help. I mean, the uh, we, we've talked consistently on this panel about the need for global responses. Um, having the US uh, consistently part of that narrative is critically important, I think. Uh, I, I think it is. it will make a huge difference. And the other thing that I would hope is, you know, we haven't spent much time talking about technology, but 
technology enablement has to be part of the answer to and getting the US technology industry up behind clean tech, I think is would be great if we could see that happening over the coming years. Maria, a line from you, a comment from you? I think it can, it's so important. I think time is short and I think to get more credibility and also the US behind the Paris Agreement will be so important because I think we all need to look upon our portfolios and see, okay, will we meet the different requirements 2030 and 2050? And I think it brings legitimacy also to have the US behind it. I think it's extremely important. Alberta, let me just bring it to you as well because um, a quick line on that and then I want to finish off a quick round robin in, in terms of uh, a pipeline. So uh, Alberto, a quick line from you in terms of uh, the potential for the new administration to inspire risk in emerging markets and take more risk and look at, look at these projects more seriously. Well, I think it's, it's, uh, it's relevant. I would say on the other side that technology and the economical uh, uh, so return of the new investments are already here. So when uh, we had uh, the, the previous administration supporting coal in the United States, so coal plants uh, were shut down at an incredible rate, not because uh, for other reasons, but because we were putting renewable instead of coal that was economic, as a full of economical reasons. And this is something that is um, uh, now evident in all the world. So we don't need to find any incentives now to develop. Now we have to so to define exactly what we, are, we were discussing about. So to create frameworks, uh, to create the will, uh, to create conditions to have companies to, uh, to take uh, the, the level of risk they want to have. But it's an easier task. So I think that in this, uh, so having this administration pushing with the others, uh, will be relevant mm -hmm. for a big change. Just a quick line from each of you in terms of technology and the role that that's going to play. You and you spark, you spark that. We have about three minutes. So a quick line from you in terms of how important technology is to enabling uh, the investing in, in the low carbon future. A line from you, Ewan, first of all, and then we'll quickly round the room. Yeah, look, we think it's critically important. We've just recently set up a venture capital fund to put $100 million in, uh, into debt and clean tech. Um, it's an absolutely critical, important part of solving the climate issue. Maria, quick line for you on technology. As I said before, I think it creates opportunities for efficiencies and for new business model. And I think uh, technologies like IoT and blockchain will be key to transform uh, developing countries. And I think this is really a possibility to close the gap between developing countries and de the developed world. So I have high belief in technology and the importance of it. And just a closing line from you, Tobias, on, on that as well. I mean, I suppose when, when we talk about low carbon, how important is technology going to be in terms of encouraging capital to, to come to emerging markets? Yeah, if you look at the if you look at the aggregate on the global energy demand um, that has evolved on the one hand side, but it has grown at a much faster rate than the renewable energy. And if you estimate our annual investments in clean technologies coming with it, as Ian and Maria alluded to, is to increase our energy efficiency, it would need an increased factor by six to, to uh, the year 2050, that we have compared levels with 2015 to limit warming by 1.5 degrees Celsius. And that, that tells you all. Okay, it's been a great conversation with all of you. Thank you for joining us today. And as I say, that consultation paper is out there now for anybody who's tuning in now to uh, get on board, join in. It is about mobilizing capital, the scale of capital. My thanks to all of you. That is to Tobias Bross, CFO, CEO, excuse me, uh, at Allianz Global Investors. I very nearly demoted Tobias. That, that, could, that could be a folly. My apologies, Tobias. Uh, Ewan, I haven't made you CFO yet, or CEO yet. Um, Noel's still in the job. The CFO, uh, Ewan Stevenson of HSBC. Uh, and of course, to Alberto de Paoli, CFO over at Enel and Maria Hakansson, CEO at Sweat Fund. I thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, let's mobilize capital, let's get it to the emerging markets and uh, take heart, uh, a great panel. And I thank you all for your time today. I wish you well for the rest of the day. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning from Dubai and from Bloomberg, I'm Manus Cranny.
Good morning from the UK. Uh, the next session follows very naturally from the one that's just finished. Our subject is strengthening the enabling environment, the actions of government and multilateral institutions. My name is Nick Stern. I'm a professor at the LSE and I chair the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment at the LSE. I'll, in I'll introduce our three very distinguished panelists in just a moment. But let me make one or two points at the beginning to frame our discussion. The first is that green growth uh, is not only essential for our future on this planet, it is also the growth story of the 21st century. Second, there's great urgency and scale that the world's infrastructure will double, roughly speaking, in the next 15 or 20 years. It has to be a completely different infrastructure than the one that came before. Otherwise, uh, even three degrees would be out of reach, let alone uh, 1.5 degrees. So there's great urgency and there's great scale. In this decay, we have to halve emissions to give ourselves a good chance of 1.5 degrees. So urgency and scale is fundamental. That's why we're emphasizing acceleration here. We have momentum, but nowhere near strong enough at the moment. The next point we have to recognize is that this big investment story, sustainable investment story, will in large measure be a private sector story. Of course, both public, private mixtures, but a big part of it will be private. So we have to ask ourselves the question, how can the private sector invest? And the final thing I want to um, underline is the overall world macro position. Obviously, we're in a deep crisis with COVID, and we have a, a, a story uh, up to the end of 2019, which had uh, a world with great investment opportunities, a world with plentiful saving, but a real challenge of turning investment opportunity into real investment programs and getting the right kind of finance in the right place in the right time. And that challenge now is set in the context of heavy unemployment around the world associated with the COVID crisis. So this is why investment, acceleration, of course, sustainable investment is so important. So how do we uh, draw all this through? How do we make things happen? Well, our panel is going to help us understand that. And we have three people here. Uh, Josue Tanaka, who's the Managing Director on Energy Efficiency and Climate Change at the EBRD. He is replacing Odile Renaud Basso, who is the President-elect of the EBRD but she has been called in um, by um, uh, Chancellor Merkel and President Macron uh, for uh, a discussion, and she's speaking now uh, to them, but Josue is stepping in. So thank you very much, Josue. We have Sadani Alexander, who is um, a Vice President of the AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, previously a very senior figure in the uh, UK Treasury and in uh, UK politics. And we have Jose Vinales, who's chairman of Standard Charter. And I think it's fair to say Standard Charter is at the forefront of this whole story uh, in the banking community. So thank you all for being with us. And let me turn to our first question. We have three questions on policy, finance, and engaging with clients. And on policy, I'll turn to you first, uh, Joe Sway. What are the key policy measures which should be pursued to scale up private climate finance mobilization? And what is your organization doing in this respect? Josue, please. Well, thank you very much, Nick, and uh, good morning uh, from London, uh, too. Um, I would uh, say perhaps that uh, the, one of the key elements that we work on in order to accelerate this mobilization and very much in the spirit, I think, of what happened in the previous session with the Climate Finance Leadership Initiative, which identifies uh,
renewable energy. We've done this, for example, in Kazakhstan on Ukraine. It's work that takes quite a long time to do, sometimes two years, three years to do. But once you do that, you open up, one, the pipeline of investments, and two, the conditions within which you know, the private sector can invest. Second example I could give you is in relation to cities. We've put at EBRD quite an emphasis on climate finance for cities. But there are a lot of questions underneath. In particular, how do you fi finance the sub-national uh, level? And the third example I could give you of this type of policy measures is really the work that I think we need to do, particularly as we reach now the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement, the work that we need to do with the countries in which we work you know, on decarbonization pathways, because this is really what's going to, in a way, integrate the macro policy side with the micro side of individual investments. So this is on the sector policy, and perhaps very quickly, two other points that I think MDBs uh, work on. Uh, one is the notion of cost reflective prices. So, you know, you, it's very difficult, you know, uh, private investors are driven by risk return. You need to have cost reflective prices for that. Obviously, particularly in this uh, period of pandemic and post pandemic, the social aspects will also have to be looked at. And finally, another piece that uh, the MDBs work on is, I would say, general work on investment climate. It's not specific to climate finance. But without that, climate finance also doesn't flow. So, Nick, these are just a few examples, I would say, of, of specific areas of work. Thank you very much, Josue. Danny, could you tell us something of the AIIB in relation to policy to pull investment through? Yes, thank you, Nick, and uh, good evening from Beijing. Um, uh, the younger generation is also uh, just uh, joining us from here. Um, uh, I, I, for the AIB, I'd start with the ambition. You rightly said at the, in your opening remarks that the, the, the sense of urgency and scale is, is, in a way, the most important place to start. For AIB, we approved a couple of months ago our first uh, corporate strategy, charting the, our plans to develop the AIB from a successful startup phase over the next decade to 2030. And one of the uh, targets that we set in that document was that by 2025, we want 50% of our investments, which are investments in infrastructure uh, in Asia and beyond, to be uh, uh, climate finance related. So climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation. And so that will then drive a lot of our work with clients. I know we'll come to that uh, in the in the coming years about the kind of projects we're developing, both in with with, with sovereign and non-sovereign uh, uh, clients. And also, it's important to say that uh, among multilateral development banks as a, as a class of institutions, cooperation amongst MDBs is also very important to develop common understandings in key areas. For example, what does it mean to be uh, aligned to the, to the Paris Agreement? How do we uh, account for greenhouse gas emissions? Um, so that when we're uh, measuring our performance on on these issues, we're 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 speaking a common language. We're using uh, common uh, common metrics so that we can see the difference that we're making. But look, also uh, MDBs are a, a, a relatively small amount of finance compared to the uh, to the overall scale of the finance that is that is needed. So also picking projects which uh, are innovative, which exemplify good practice, which can help to demonstrate uh, future directions. The projects that make a great deal of impact in themselves because they can then be uh, developed by others, I think is a critical role that, that, that MDBs can play to catalyze the right kind of investment at the right kind of scale uh, to support the objectives that we're all uh, signed up to in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Danny. And uh, uh, Jose, um, as a private sector, leading private sector banking institution, what do you look for in the policies that enable you uh, to get uh, involved on scale? Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Nick, and, and good day to good day to everybody. Um, I think that we already start from a better position than a year or two ago, which is that there is a significant alignment of objectives between the public sector and the private sector. And now what we need is action 
on both sides and to uh, exploit the synergies that we have in order to deliver on the scale of financing which is needed on the uh, climate change and more broadly on the sustainability sphere. And I think there are a number of things that can and should be done by governments. The first one is that in a number of countries, advanced economies and some uh, emerging markets and developing economies down the road, there are going to be uh, COVID recovery packages. And I think it's very important that there is a deep dialogue with the private sector and the private financial sector so that their services can be used in order to get the biggest bang for the buck in delivering on the green and sustainability agenda. And I think, for example, that the EU, European Union Green Deal is a good example of that. Second, very important to scale up the issuance of sovereign green bonds and sustainability bonds. Uh, this is something that I think is a must, but in a number of places, it needs putting in place the right framework to make this possible. Now, beyond what governments can do there, there are a number of things that regulators can also do. One very important thing is make sure that when regulation um, is, is, is constructed, uh, you don't uh, take too narrow a focus on financing the transition because there can be un, you know, uh, unwanted effects. I think that going from brown to green means going from brown to semi-brown to semi-green to green. So one needs to make sure that one is realistic and, 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 and that regulation is consistent with that journey that we all need to uh, make. Another thing is to harmonize the various standards and the myriad of definitions which exist about green and sustainable, because investors really need clarity. A lot of institutional investors and other financial institutions have clear fiduciary um, responsibilities and clear mandates, but it, it, it's fundamental to avoid greenwashing and sustainability washing. So you need to know exactly where you are investing. So I think that having more clarity and homogeneity on these uh, definitions and standards is critical. And if we think specifically of emerging markets and developing economies, governance is fundamental. Governance in terms of legal certainty, avoiding bribery and corruption, which is a big deterrent for investors to bring their money to those markets. So that's critical. And finally, governments cannot act alone. They need to act uh, in a concerted manner. We have committed a standard charter to facilitate funding for about $75 billion over the next five years to uh, sustainable infrastructures and renewable sources of energy. And that is going to be done in part in close collaboration with international financial institutions through blended finance and other means of developing bankable projects. So very much in sync with what Danny was mentioning. Thank you very much. Um, we've had some very clear answers on um, how to get the multipl multiplication and the acceleration. Good examples, regulatory policy, chart a uh, clear path, uh, clarity, um, removing, the, uh, removing the obstacles, and of course, working together amongst the MDBs, with the private sector, with the public sector. So I think those are very clear, strong lessons on how to uh, scale up from those who are actually doing it. Let's now turn to the finance side. And um, Jose, if, I'm open, if it's all right to start with you on the finance, what are the specific financing instruments which can accelerate the deployment of private climate finance in emerging markets? And can you give us some examples? Jose, please. Um, well, I think that um, uh, today the focus has been on green and, and, and sustainable bonds, and I think that's been important. But we need to broaden the uh, financial uh, products spectrum beyond that. So we need to move into investment funds, into green and sustainable loans, green and sustainable deposits, green and sustainable money market funds. All of that is going to be very important. We have recently published a green and sustainable uh, product framework that leads financial products to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And to offer uh, a couple of examples of, of things that uh, we're doing, we launched last year a uh, sustainable deposit where the assets financed by the money coming into that deposit are 
very, very closely linked, in, demonstrably so, with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We opened up this possibility first to corporates, and we had a lot of success, and now we have developed it to, uh, you know, to, to, to just normal people, retail deposits, so that people can vote with the money, where they want to put the money on. And you know what? In less than a year, we've already gotten $2 billion added to those deposits and counting. So that would be one specific example. And then on blended finance, whose importance cannot be underestimated, I think that the private sector working alongside with the public sector, and we do that a lot with IFIs, with institutions like that of Danny and others, we are able to put together projects where blended finance gives a big multiplier in terms of financing. So we have committed to catalyzing a further $5 billion of blended finance over the next five years, and that's going to lead to a large multiplier which is going to help us accomplish the 75 billion target I was mentioning a few minutes ago. Thank you very much, Jose. Uh, Danny, can you tell us something about AIB instruments? Well, I think the key thing for, for us and for MDBs is to use the finance we have to the maximum effect to, 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 uh, to mobilize uh, much greater amounts of private finance uh, into, into projects and into uh, into the green finance market. Um, so th that means that for AIB, it's not only uh, uh, project loans, uh, also equity investments are very important. We recently committed to uh, Lightsmith Climate Resilience Fund, which is uh, a fund investing in, in, in climate resilient projects in, in Asia, um, which again helps to uh, 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 multiply many fold the impact of our finance. Um, but also, I think for AIB, we've we've become uh, active in supporting the development of uh, of, of financial markets for uh, climate finance. So, um, recently with Amundi, we launched a climate bond portfolio, which was seeking to uh, assess not just the, um, the, 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 the 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 climate compliance, if you like, of the proceeds of the bond, but of the issuer. Um, and so with Amundi, we developed a framework which will enable us to assess whether uh, the, the issuers of the bonds are Paris compliant. framework will be uh, not only useful for the deployment of the $500 million that we've allocated to that portfolio to start with, but also that it others will get involved in. So those would be two examples going beyond traditional uh, MDB finance to looking uh, uh, much more broadly into other areas. Thank you very much, uh, Danny. Now, Jezra, I know you've had very long uh, experience uh, in financing instruments at the EBRD, where you've um, been for a number of years, which, uh, is it 30 now, uh, Josue? So you could take us through their experience. Yeah. So perhaps just to complement um, what uh, Jose and uh, Danny mentioned, I think perhaps I, I'll just focus on two points. One may sound like a truism, but it's an important one to make, which is for MDBs to mobilize private sector, we need to work with the private sector. So it sounds very obvious, but I think it's one that needs to be said. And therefore, at the BRD, for example, we really have actually a target in terms of our private involvement, 75%, and within climate finance, we do try to keep you know, close to that target. Therefore, two thirds of our climate finance to date has been in the private sector. So that's the first comment I, I would make, right? That, uh, uh, again, I'm sorry if it sounds so obvious, but I think it is something that needs to be said. The second point to complement the points that uh, Jose and Danny have mentioned, in terms of instruments, and perhaps linking to the first topic, you know, on, on policy, is just to give you one example uh, in Egypt, in this case, of the kind of work you can do that perhaps is not a financing instrument in itself, but that is an immense mobilizer. And in the case of Egypt, the, the example I would like to give you is the work that IBRD did with the government of Egypt on deriving, defining, 
a model PPA for renewable energy. Again, it took time. You know, we involved the private sector, we involved the government, but we developed that model PPA. The result of it was and is the largest solar project in uh, Africa. So it's the solar array in uh, Ben Ben, 1.5 gigawatts capacity, supply for about 5 million Egyptians. And just, you know, as a, a point to illustrate the size of this, uh, the size of about 5,000 football fields, you know, in terms of solar uh, array. But maybe to conclude, uh, Nick, and uh, land back to the question about a uh, finance instrument, underneath this, that model PPA managed to mobilize 30 private developers, right? EBRD financed 16 of them, right? And, you know, the mobilization of this within our 16 projects was $1 billion of private finance. So again, just to give you an illustration of, I would say, the tiering and how different instruments, whether blended finance, whether the fund structures that Danny mentioned, or whether this type of technical assistance to a certain extent, all are practical instruments for private sector finance mobilization. Thank you. Thank you, Josue, and we've had a very rich set of examples, which I'll not try to summarize, but I think what we've seen is creativity and opportunity in the financing instruments being created in different but complementary and overlapping ways in those three institutions. Let's spend our last few minutes on engagement with, uh, with clients. And I'll start that one with you, Danny, if, um, if I may, and then move to um, Jose and give the last word to uh, Joe's way. So engagement with clients is clearly key as a part of accelerating uh, private uh, climate action. Um, the know your clients, of course, is the first rule of, uh, of banking. And could you help us understand how you bring sustainable development and climate into the engagement with your uh, clients, Danny. Um, thanks very much, Nick. It's, uh, it's a really important question, and it's important to distinguish between the sovereign and the non-sovereign clients. So, going back to what I said at the beginning about AIB's corporate strategy and the focus that we have uh, for the development of the next the bank in the next few years on climate, that comes from our members. It's our members who have been involved in shaping and developing that strategy. And so, in that sense, the 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 the, the sovereign clients are really uh, at the at the core of giving AIB that focus for the next uh, few years. And it's interesting also to see how some of the domestic policy frameworks are are developing. You know, more and more uh, of our members around the world uh, adopting targets for when they want to become carbon neutral. Most recently, China announcing a target of 2060. Many European members aiming at uh, 2050. And so that creates a very high level framework to which MDBs can respond by coming forward not just with instruments but with uh, a policy and knowledge work that can help to uh, uh, help to work with clients to, to see the direction that uh, that they should go in um, for the for the for the non-sovereign uh, clients where again we're seeking to grow substantially the share of our business that's non-sovereign in the way that the EBRD has done so successfully over the decades um, you know, we see engagement on climate as particularly uh, crucial to, to growing that side of our, of, of, our, of our business. And that means being very clear uh, in, our, in our shop window, if you like, about the importance that we attach to climate, about the sorts of things that we're doing. And over time, as we finance projects, uh, uh, highlighting what we've done so that, that clients can see uh, what, we're, what we're interested in. But also, you know, reaching out through events like this to, to highlight the fact that in Asia, particularly, uh, AIB uh, is very much in the market for financing projects of all sorts which help to deliver climate change objectives uh, is an important part of that too. So also thank you for this opportunity um, to, 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 to reach out in that way. Thank, thank you, Danny. Uh, Jose, please. Well, the first thing in engaging with our clients is to be crystal clear about what we are prepared to do and what we are not prepared to do learning to say no and not like that but maybe yes in another matter 
this is something which is very important. Now, this is something which is very clear, for instance, in our position statements on climate change and on sustainability more generally, which define the way we want to do business. So clarity is the first thing. The second is helping clients, both private and public sector clients, understand the risks that uh, climate change uh, and unsustainable business practices pose to their own business and also to the broader environment in which they operate. And third, helping those clients manage the transition towards more sustainable uh, business models, uh, fighting climate change, moving to greener, more sustainable. And last, I think that when we talk about investors, helping them understand the fantastic opportunities which are out there. We published earlier in the year our Opportunity 2030 report, which looks at the private sector investment opportunities in 15 fastest growing emerging markets um, between now and 2030 in three domains, energy, clean energy, uh, water safety, and, and then sustainable infrastructures. $10 trillion of private sector investment opportunities, half of them in clean sector. Great opportunity and we're doing our best in order to bring our investors to put their money where it's most needed in emerging markets and developing economies to make a difference. Thank you very much, uh, Jose. Josue, please. Time, I'll just go a bit telegraphic style. I think first of all, and complementing, I like very much Jose's point about first saying, you know, learning to say no uh, or say no in a positive way. But what we try to do, first of all, is technical engagement. Very often clients come with a project. The opportunity for a climate finance opportunity is not identified, but we work with the client to develop that opportunity. So that's the first one. The second one is our engagement with, I would say, green financing with private banks. Over time, the last 15 years, we've built a network of over 150 private banks in our countries of operation in which we essentially built together with them green finance to show that it is you know, a good business. And the final one looking forward is work that we're starting to do on climate corporate governance in uh, financial institutions linked, for example, to the introduction of the TCFD uh, in, in, uh, with our clients. So Nick, I leave it here so you can conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I found that an enormously productive discussion. If we're to get investment going and the right kind of finance, the right place at the right time for that sustainable investment, what we've heard in a very clear and strong way from all three of the very experienced people, imaginative people on this call, is the importance of strategy and clarity. Investment needs strategy and clarity. It needs to look ahead uh, with confidence to see what are the big opportunities that are there? The second is to engage very closely with clients. Uh, banking and finance has to be uh, between people who understand the other uh, people who are involved, and that involves uh, close engagement. And finally, the detailed preparation. Uh, instruments matter. They have to be designed for the circumstances. The investment climate needs capital design and putting uh, together in order for people to invest with confidence. But what we've seen, I think, from our uh, three contributors here is a, a very clear example of how strategy produces results if you get the right kind of people uh, behind it, recognize the opportunities, work together with people and do the detailed hard graph to uh, get everything in place. It's a very impressive story and I'd like to thank you all very much for uh, educating us this morning. I've learned tremendously and uh, it makes me uh, really optimistic about what we can do and uh, a little less pessimistic as to whether we will do it. Uh, uh, to coin a phrase, yes we can. So thank you, thank you all very much indeed. Goodbye.
Um, hello, everyone. My name is Sherry Madeira. I am the Chief Industry and Government Affairs Officer at Refinitiv, uh, and I'm also the Chair of the Future of Sustainable Data Alliance. Um, and I'm delighted to be here talking to Dr. Majun, uh, who has an incredible number of credits to his name. Uh, I'll try and do a short justice to that before we kick off. Uh, Dr. Ma is the Director for the Center for Finance and Development at Tsinghua University, the Chairman of the China Green Finance Committee, a member of the PBOC's Monetary Policy Committee, uh, and he chairs the supervision work stream of the NGFS. Um, he's also the man that I often call when uh, thinking about what's going on with the world and sustainable finance. Uh, so hopefully today will be, uh, like many other sessions, uh, incredibly interesting and fruitful for us all to learn. Uh, thanks for joining us, Dr. Ma. Thank you, Sherry. Great, well, let's jump in. Um, and we're slated to cover the view from emerging markets today. So the largest emerging market in many definitions of EM is China. Um, and China has been a very active uh, participant in the topic of, social, uh, of sustainable finance uh, for many years. Um, the question is, where do you see China's role in global regulation and standards on sustainable finance now and into the future? Now, maybe I'll start with uh, what China has been doing, and uh, I extend the topic to international role. Uh, in China, we began to think about building a green financial system as early as in 2014. And in 2016, China issued this, uh, what you call regulation, uh, which is guidelines for green financial system. That was a joint um, release by seven different ministries led by the PBOC. So within that guidelines, we had many um, what I call pillars in terms of taxonomy, disclosure requirements, incentive products, and so on and so forth. So over the past uh, four or five years, we pretty much have a uh, system which included three sets of taxonomies and uh, all these are top down, um, which could be described as regulation issued by different you know, ministries um, regulating the financial sector. Uh, these taxonomies included one for banking, uh, namely for green credit, one for green bonds, one for green projects. And the second key aspect of the green financial system in China is disclosure requirement. We, back in 2017, had a mandatory requirement for major polluters to disclose environmental information on a mandatory basis. And over time, we moved towards a semi compulsory scheme. Uh, which asked the listed companies to either disclose or complain or, or explain. And uh, now, um, by end of this year, we're going to have mandatory requirement for all listed companies and all bond issuers to disclose environmental information. Of course, there are a couple of other uh, incentive related issues, including through central bank providing cheap financing through commercial bank to the uh, uh, green projects. And uh, at the local level, there are lots of uh, interest subsidies and guarantees and so on. So this forms what I call a uh, green financial system, of course, supported the uh, uh, rapid development of the products, including uh, what we have uh, in the green banking space, more than 11 trillion RMB worth of green bonds in terms of outstanding number, and uh, more than 1.2 trillion RMB worth of uh, green bonds issued. I'm sorry if I was mistaken on the first number, it should be uh, the green credit, uh, 11 trillion. And the second number is 1.2 trillion uh, RMB uh, worth of green bonds issued. And uh, uh, the third number, which is also very impressive, 700 green funds set up uh, as of now. And uh, now extending to the global discussion, um, China was very keen in um, driving and uh, being engaged in a lot of international initiatives, including uh, through the G20 Green Finance Study Group, which you were quite familiar with. I was a co-chair for three years uh, between 2016 and 2018. And uh, during these periods, um, the study group successfully mainstreamed the uh, green finance concept um, as uh, the consensus um, of global political leaders. And we also participated actively in the NGFS and uh, uh, more recently launched the uh, Green Muslim Principles for Bell and Road together with City of London. Uh, which is very successful operation uh, in the past two years. So these are the efforts that China is trying to make um, to integrate uh, with other parts of the world in jointly developing the green financial system. Um, but still, I think uh, the uh, 
uh, participation by emerging markets are relatively limited. Um, in most of these international collaborations, we had uh, uh, a large number of OECD country uh, representatives and institutions, um, but uh, I'm really hoping that uh, uh, emerging markets, which is a topic today, uh, can be much more involved uh, um, than we have today. And, and on, on that topic, I mean, you, you've already referenced a number of these uh, global engagement platforms, um, you know, NGFS, the Network for Greening the Financial System, the IPSF, the GIPs, uh, which I remember fondly uh, early days of drafting and have taken off uh, now. So in, in the emerging markets, I mean, what sort of participation are they having in these platforms? And are there any unique considerations uh, for them to green the financial systems and participate in the global financial system? Yeah, let me talk about three international platforms, which I'm quite uh, actively involved. One is NGFS, that's the uh, central banks and the supervisor network for greening the financial system. It was initially founded by eight country central banks um, and China was part of that. Um, now it's a network of more than 70 members, um, including uh, their central banks and uh, financial supervisors. Now, initially, at least in the first year, uh, it was largely OECD countries with very limited uh, emerging market participation. Second year, I think uh, we're seeing more. But uh, in terms of representation um, relative to population, I think uh, still uh, emerging markets are very underrepresented. I'm strongly uh, 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 endorsing the NGFS view that uh, we need to diversify further in terms of membership, especially by attracting uh, countries and uh, their regulators from Asia, uh, especially Southeast Asia and Africa and Latin America. And uh, I think that effort is, uh, is delivering uh, some results. The second platform is called IPSF, uh, International Platform for Sustainable Finance, which is relatively new, uh, launched a little more than a year ago, initiated by EU. Uh, China, again, is part of that. And uh, uh, we're launching a working group. I think it's the first working group under the IPSF called uh, Sustainable Finance Taxonomy, which I co-chair. And uh, again, uh, my view is that uh, uh, there's a lot of OECD country representation and the emerging markets are lacking and we need to push for that. Now, the only international uh, network uh, which I see as mainly focused on emerging market uh, is uh, the uh, GIP, uh, which is called Green Investment Principles that was initiated by China Green Finance Committee and City of London two years ago. Uh, we now have 14 countries uh, represented, uh, 37 organizations uh, signed up. And uh, uh, in the future, we're going to launch uh, GIP local chapters, not only having two headquarters, one in Beijing, one in London, but uh, we won't have uh, local chapters in you know, Central Asia, in Africa, in Latin American countries. Uh, that's uh, how we intend to extend the network inference um, to the most needed places, um, which is where the uh, system of finance is, is, is lacking. Right. Um, you, you mentioned the NGFS, uh, and there was a, a recent report out in September outlining ERA, environmental risk analysis, and how to translate environmental risks into financial risks. Um, the report proposed six different opportunities for mainstreaming ERA. Uh, my question is, I mean, how is this pl applicable to emerging markets? Is it equally applicable or are there special considerations there as well? Uh, maybe just a few words on EI itself for those uh, who are not familiar with the concept. It's uh, environmental risk analysis, but it covers uh, environmental related risks and climate related risks. A typical analysis under that uh, uh, scene is uh, <clears throat> to quantify the financial risks arising from a financial institution's exposure to environmental and climate risks. Just to give you one particular example, we conducted such an environmental risk analysis on a coal-fired power plant, uh, looking at uh, uh, how much the uh, default rate is going to go up um, from a bank perspective if they continue to lend to such a power plant. And we show that under certain assumptions, the uh, default probability will go up from 3% today to more than 20% in 10 years time. This is a type of analysis which we are now strongly encouraging banks, asset managers, insurance companies to conduct so that they will be aware of such risks and begin to manage these risks. 
after they quantify such risks, I think it will be stronger internal incentive for them to um, divest uh, from many of these uh, high carbon assets and polluting assets and devote more resources to the uh, green and uh, sustainable assets. In terms of application, um, most of the uh, um, institutions that adopted the ERA are uh, again in OECD countries. There are a couple of Chinese large institutions have done that, uh, but most of other emerging market economies have relatively limited awareness capacity and uh, uh, government uh, um, encouragement. That's why we raised uh, these six options uh, for different countries regulators to consider. In terms of emerging markets, I think awareness raising is probably the key for the moment. If their central banks and supervisors can begin conducting environmental risk analysis by themselves, um, maybe taking a couple of industries as example, I think that will send a strong signal to the industry that this is necessary. And secondly, uh, disclosure is important. Um, I think uh, most of the regulators will need to consider requiring disclosure by financial institutions of their exposure to uh, high carbon and uh, polluting assets. By requiring such uh, disclosure, they will be forced to consider uh, how to quantify the future risk and how to manage these risks. Right. Well, disclosure, I think, is, is, is definitely near and dear to, to, to my heart. Uh, you know, Infinitive being a data company and, and disclosure is obviously forming a big part of the data that's being used to drive uh, capital into sustainable investments. And I guess my question is, is, is about data. Um, and I think that there's a, you know, a, a growing um, commentary about data gaps and in fact data holes uh, in terms of what it is that investors have access to uh, in order to be able to deploy capital. Um, and how does this apply to emerging markets? I mean, is there also some lessons that we can learn positively about how it is we can use technology, sensors, geospatial data in order to be able to accelerate the use of data uh, across the world? And what's your view? The lack of uh, quality environmental data, I think is a key bottleneck uh, for green financing in many places, especially emerging markets. Now, there are a couple of things we can do. One is to improve disclosure requirements. Um, in the country with mandatory disclosure requirements for initially large companies and later on for all companies, I think it will substantially improve the availability and quality of data, uh, but it will take some time. The second thing is about data sharing between different agencies. In China, we had experience of connecting the Minister of Environment with uh, financial authorities, uh, which means that uh, a lot of environmental data, for example, you know, CO2 emission and other uh, pollutants uh, emissions are collected already by Minister of Environment. And previously they were not shared um, with the banking authority. And now we are building such connections at both uh, central and local level, uh, which will you know, make bank much easier, uh, you know, uh, assess it, <clears throat> assessing the, uh, uh, such data in quantifying the environmental and climate risks of you know, loans. The third thing is about uh, technology, as you said, uh, you know, sensors and big data, and the AI technologies should be used. Uh, there are lots of lots of scenarios. We did a report uh, summarizing the application of FinTech in green finance recently. Uh, it was a piece of work jointly done by my Tsinghua Center and the Paulson Institute. We uh, reviewed 90 something applications already uh, in China and elsewhere. Um, I think that there are a lot of opportunities for such technology to improve the availability and reduce the cost of uh, their um, you know, generation and the usage so that uh, to uh, enhance the, uh, uh, the, the usability of such data. The last thing I'd like to mention is uh, uh, governments and probably NGOs need to consider setting some sort of platform connecting uh, green finance with green projects, which is also you can call a, uh, a project that resolves the information asymmetry problem. Um, a good example in Hozhou, uh, which you probably know, one of the uh, regional pilot program for green finance in China. What they did is uh, uh, the local government set up a e-platform, uh, which now includes uh, all major green projects information and include all uh, local banks green loan information and asking them to uh, really match uh, within the platform. And I heard one story from the local government in Hujo uh, saying that they matched the one green loan with one green project within nine minutes. <laughs> this is the power of progress. You know, internet and the big data. 
Great. Well, and, and what we're finding, you know, through our, our future of sustainable data alliance is, is as well, it's, you know, data needs to be thought about slightly differently going forward. Uh, you know, often we're speaking about geospatial data or location based or mapping data, um, but often that has to be paired with your call for increased dis disclosures. So we don't know where assets are or where companies are doing business. Uh, we're not able to, again, trace that back uh, for investors to make actionable decisions. So uh, I think this is definitely a journey that we're all on together, emerging or mature market. Um, speaking of emerging markets and the world we're in at the moment, uh, obviously COVID-19 um, has affected the world um, and in particular emerging markets have uh, experienced the health crisis uh, and, and now are, are looking at how it is that they're going to deal with the economic crisis. Um, and I think that there are some really good examples of sustainable investment and deploying capital sustainably as being still a very top priority around the globe. What's your view? Do you feel that as uh, governments and economies start requiring funds for recovery, uh, that the positioning of a priority of green finance and the positioning and priority of sustainability overall, uh, is that at risk of moving down the priority scale? I think the COVID impact on different countries are quite different. Um, for some of the uh, small emerging markets, uh, where the fiscal capacity is low and they're under a lot of fiscal stress because revenue came down so much and spending goes up due to you know, pressure on healthcare and on subsidies for unemployed people. I think they have uh, um, less money uh, really to spend on the uh, green projects. And uh, uh, that's a negative aspect, but in some of the larger economies, uh, which will observe, for example, the US, Europe and China, fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus are very strong. And uh, a large part of uh, these uh, stimulus uh, package can be used for green and sustainable projects. And that's why Europe is leading the way uh, in you know, driving green recovery and China uh, is also very actively uh, discussing uh, various options on how to deploy a uh, substantial you know, part of the uh, stimulus money to green projects such as uh, renewables and uh, electric vehicle charging stations so once the fiscal authority allocates a substantial portion of the, for example, in China, the proceeds of special bonds, then the banks will follow uh, because, uh, you know, the fiscal money can be serving as 30% of equity in a typical project and the other 70% of money need to come from the uh, banks and the bond market. And uh, uh, with fiscal and financing uh, jointly uh, working towards green recovery, I think it will uh, do a lot in ensuring that uh, uh, carbon reduction and also emission, other type of emission reduction will be achieved um, substantially during this phase of uh, um, infrastructure spending. And I mean, is there an opportunity here? Uh, I'm always a glasses half full sort of person. I mean, is there an opportunity for new financial products that are coming after the pandemic in order to support a green recovery? Things like transition bonds, which are, are, are starting to, to, to take hold or pandemic bonds that have a green element. Uh, there are quite a bit of uh, uh, COVID bonds already, uh, which we discussed in the you know, past few months. Um, but uh, the transition bonds are probably more interesting, uh, given especially in China, the uh, government has just announced the carbon neutrality target um, by 2060. So a lot of discussions on what to do uh, to convert these uh, um, high carbon companies into greener companies. For example, we began to discuss with Shanxi province, which is a province of a very heavy reliance on coal, um, on how to use transition bond to assist the uh, coal-related industries to uh, transform themselves. And one particular idea is that uh, issue a transition bond, use the proceeds to buy out a coal-fired power generator. So you become the owner of the coal-fired gen uh, uh, power uh, generator, and uh, you can then inject resources for example, renewable energy technologies, uh, new management teams, and uh, convert this company into a uh, maybe a solar or wind company within five years. So by then, three things are achieved. The number one, emission is stopped earlier um, than otherwise, right? And secondly, uh, you can avoid the uh, financial impact um, of a failing coal-fired power generator because if you let it uh, go bust, it's going to default on the banking system, and we should avoid that. And thirdly, we can avoid the uh, uh, large unemployment um, due to the uh, failure of the uh, coal company. 
So uh, this is an ideal outcome, which we are hoping uh, to achieve, but a lot of technical details need to be sorted out in terms of who is going to issue and what kind of uh, uh, you know, yields uh, that we should offer to investors and where the foreign participation you know, could be arranged and so on and so forth. Right. Well, uh, it sounds like there's a lot for us to innovate still. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Ma. Um, you, know, you didn't disappoint, learned a lot already uh, over the course of this session. And I guess my only regret is that we weren't able to do it in person. Uh, hopefully that's going to be something we can do soon. So lovely to see you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. It is an honor to be invited to join this distinguished assembly of speakers for the Green Horizon Summit. Ladies and gentlemen, we are running out of time. Average global temperature is currently estimated to be 1.1 degree above pre-industrial times. Based on existing trends, the world could cross the 1.5 threshold within the next two decades and two degree threshold early during the second half of the century. However, the key conclusion from the IPCC is that limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees is still narrowly possible. We need nothing short of a global financial transition to put us on track. But while the climate finance flows needed to achieve this has been increasing, it is not happening rapidly enough. On the supply side of finance, that is because market risk is misaligned with climate reality. Markets need information to price climate physical transition and legal risk and balance them against the higher upfront capital requirement of green investment. And they need pricing mechanisms that internalize the external cost of carbon emissions. Financiers need financial products to invest in and bankable projects that create investment opportunities. On the demand side of finance, that is because entrepreneurs face a range of policy, institutional and technical barriers to convert investment opportunities into bankable projects. Even the best wind resources in the world will not make wind energy competitive if fossil fuels are heavily subsidized or if it takes three years to an entrepreneur to get an operating license. Whilst COVID-19 is increasing the needs for green investment to revive economies on low emission, climate resilient development pathways, it is reducing the public resources available to developing countries. The Green Climate Fund is the world's largest dedicated fund financing climate action in developing countries. We are working with our partners to remove the supply and demand barriers that are stopping this financial transition in developing countries. There is much to be done, and we are working to provide the solution. We need several things. 
we need to support developing countries in integrating policies, climate action, and economic recovery, economic policies for climate action and economic recovery to set up a conducive environment for green resilient investment. We need to develop new valuation methodologies for climate resilient infrastructure to support asset repricing in global financial markets. We need to design new green and climate resilient financial products, such as green ABS or resilient bonds for developing countries to access institutional finance. We need to make blended finance work, particularly for LDCs and seeds and for adaptation and ecosystem protection, where efforts to leverage private investment have so far fallen short of what is required. We need to enhance the capacity of national financial institutions to access domestic and international capital markets for green, resilient investment. We need to create innovative financial instruments and financing structure that can increase access to climate finance in developing countries without increasing their sovereign debts. GCF is supporting a portfolio of $20 billion of low emission climate resilient investment in developing countries with close to $6 billion in GCF co-financing. GCF co-financing usually takes the form of grant for policy and project development or concessional forceless non-grant instruments to de-risk first of its kind investment. And our board meeting this week will consider another $1 billion of GCF co-financing in climate proposal. I hope that the Green Horizon Summit will encourage new initiatives and partnerships and help drive the public and private financial transition to a sustainable and resilient future for all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Yannick, and thank you to all the speakers this morning for some very insightful discussions. In, ses in session six, we will turn our attention to nature and biodiversity loss, already a huge area of concern and one that the business and financial communities are learning to grapple with. We'll now have a break. Do go and visit our sponsors' virtual booths and ask them the questions you would like to about the transition. We'll begin the next session at 11.30 Greenwich Mean Time. Thank you. <laughs>